this potential review. And we're studying group actions, and I have abbreviated uh, <coughs> notation by saying that just G, X is a G space, so. means I had a, a G action on X. An action. And we have come to study the quotients. That's just uh, the basic thing and, and not very interesting uh, because there, there's no quality to this. There's no topology, there's no real algebraic geometry, there's no, there's, there's no more interesting thing. So we considered the first example where x was a square. Talked about this yesterday. I'm just repeating. Structures are very similar. Structures are similar. Uh, this thing, this triangle is defined by the boundaries are linear pieces. Uh, it's a fundamental object in Euclidean geometry, as is the square. It's very interesting. It's a very good example to practice. If you want to write a paper, I hope you write a little paper for this course so you can get some credit for it, just a small paper about quotients. And I think that's a good example to include. So, <clears throat> another example we talked about um, a bit is <clears throat> X itself. Uh, is G, and H is a subgroup of G, that's the symbol 
magnetic subgroup of G. And so an H, uh, so this subgroup acts, subgroup, so let me write it out. An H, a subgroup of G. Acting by right multiplication, acting on the right. So I mean that's a little bit of formal nonsense, but uh, let's see what that means. That means that uh, if you have an element x in x, in, which is a group element, and, and an element in in h. Uh, then this gets mapped as the action map, and so this is the action map to x times h. This is the multiplication on the right. You wouldn't believe how important that is, but it's really important. Right multiplication. This is a right action. It's not a left action. This is a right action. But it's just a matter of keeping things straight. Don't worry too much about it. Action on the right. And this is a free action. Implicitly, we talked about this uh, uh, yesterday. If you, uh, there is no isotropy. There's not, nothing fixes a point except the identity. Right. So, uh, right. So, let me, let me just say, if, if it had something fixing a point, that would mean x times h equals x, and I ask my grandson, and he tells me you can cancel that, so that's the identity. Okay, so <clears throat> it's really a free action, and so we have the, a very nice picture of this free action. Uh, uh, the, here, here are the orbits, so if you have a point g here, well, I call, I call it x, and um, that's the orbit. Uh, that's the orbit h of x. So I'll write it on the on the right hand side and remind myself that it's a right action. And so we have here the, what we call this is the equivalence class, the point which corresponds to that orbit. Uh, the the guys in group theory start to call this thing coset. I just call it the orbit. It's the orbit by the right action. So what we get here, right, what we get here is we have upstairs space is G, and then you have G, G modulo the right action of H, so we write a G modulo A. That's a very important example. That's an extremely important example because uh, it, you can apply this example in the case where you have a G action on X, some X, some other X, and you take H to be the isotropy group of a point. And you have this construction, g down to g minus well, h. We're now right it here, the isotropic group of a point. So g, just a formal construction. And you have another construction, which is you go to the orbit, g times x. You have two things, the orbit, and then the right, the quotient by the right action of this guy. And now an element here um, is a cosat g x. Yeah. And to get a map from here to here, I just map this to g x times x. 
So this is a co-set, uh, if you if you like. This this is this is the set itself, which I'm I'm regarding upstairs in G, and I let it act on X, and it's a map, and and, and the isotropy doesn't act, so this is just G of X. <coughs> this is what I talked about yesterday. This is the correct factorial way of looking at this. The G modulo the isotropy of this. We call this thing a homogeneous space, this is a G homogeneous space. And a good example of it is you just have some action and you, you have it, you take an orbit. So you take an orbit, G times X. And there are two things, G modulo the, act, the isotropy and uh, G, of, G of the point. And if you have G modulo the isotropy, and the equivalence class is the, the coset, but you can think of that as really a set in G and let it act on, on X, and it goes exactly perfectly to G of X. So this induced mapping here is an isomorphism. Just check it. You can't, it's one of these things you have to do yourself. Yeah. But that's a fundamental di diagram. So let me just say this is a fundamental diagram. shows you how important the construction is uh, if you have a subgroup, which in our, that case is an isotropy subgroup, you mod out by the subgroup, you get this very interesting homogeneous state. Now, if you have this very interesting homogeneous let's return, let's return for a moment to the homogeneous space. miracle that will sound stupid, but it's a wonderful thing, is the wonderful thing, is, is, uh, it's luck maybe, I don't know, is that left action, left multiplication, and right multiplication, Yeah, so you only really have, if you have x equals g, and you take two elements, you take uh, an element x and x, and you take two elements here, in G, G1, and G2, you have left multiplication of G1 and times right multiplication of G2 applied to X. That's left, that's, uh, you put, I, I'm supposed to put uh, G2 on the, on, the, on the right, so that's G1, G, X, G2, and that, of course, is the same thing you don't care. I mean, it's, it, you can't even see the difference here, so it's, that's the same as right multiplication by G2. Left multiplication by G1. Yes. And what do you mean by homogeneous space? Um, what I mean precisely is that. Okay. Mm -hmm. That that's the definition of G homogeneous. I wrote it here and said it, but but but, but uh, thank you for the question. The word homogeneous uh, um, in English, you know very well. Uh, it means all the same, all the same, everything is the same. And you see, if, if, if this is act, G, G acts on this space, I'm going to talk, I'm going to em emphasize the action of G on this space. So let, let's look at the action of G0 of a coset. This is left multiplication now. G0 of a coset is just G0 times the same. And 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 where G zero is anything in your group, and so it it says that G zero acts transitively on this set. 
right? So it's homogeneous in the sense you go, go everywhere, it's all the same with respect to G. Okay, so, so let me just say, see, so this is homogeneous, let's write it in, in, to, to help out with the notation. Homogeneous with respect to the right multiplication. So the way you should think is, here's an equivalence class, and this equivalence class is mod, mod h on the right. Mod h on the right. So here's x, and this entire thing, x, h, x on h. Okay. But if you hit it with G on the left, it's well defined. Because here's G of X, G times A, so this is a group, and here's G X of H. It says that this, this action of G acts on cosets. Maybe I should write G0, because Mr. Weiss asked me about this that I think one element of the group acts, it's sort of confusing, acting on a general point. Okay. So it says the left, because left and right action commute, it means that the G action on the left uh, stabilizes the equivalence relationship. So you, so you have here G modulo H, that's a, G, that's a homogeneous space on the, with respect to X axis. So, And an orbit, an orbit, is, is obviously homogeneous. <laughs> it's, it's the orbit of a group. It's homogeneous with respect to the left action, an orbit. And so you, you write down formally what it is, is a homogeneous space, G modulo the isotropy, and you write it down as an orbit, and you see that there's a well-defined isomorphism, a set it, at least, and this is a perfect isomorphism, this isomorphism carries the G action here to the G action there. So I want to write a word that everybody uses to describe such nice homomorphism. So notation. Suppose X and Y are G spaces. And phi is a map. Map to three G spaces. Yeah. And you just think, what should it mean that this map is compatible with respect to the G action? So compatibility. respect to the G actions means that you call this compatibility because you, you know, if you get along with some person you like very much. Now we just have big arguments with Prop out about history of mathematics, so we're not compatible anymore, probably. <laughs> you know the word compatible. I'm my wife and I the proof that my wife and I are compatible is that we've been married for 56 years or something like that. that that's, a, that's, that's a historical proof. <laughs> that's the proof of the naturality of the relationship between me and my wife. Okay, the compatibility, compatibility you know the English word, with respect to the actions means that phi uh, of, of g of x equals G of phi of x, right? You just take G and map it, or map it and take G. 
right? This is obvious no notion of compatibility. And the, the notation is, is, this is called G equivariant. That's the word G equivariant. And to really make you mad at me, I will make an observation, which is an, a useful observation. So a, a, be, a, a better, I don't know what the word better means, but I'll, so I'll write it in quotes. A better viewpoint of this. is we look at map x, y, map x, y. <laughs> of course, if you're doing uh, topology, that should be a continuous map. Or if you're doing uh, algebraic geometry, that should be an algebraic, algebraic geometric morphism, or whatever. If you're doing group theory, it should be a homomorphism, so on. So map uh, is, is a G-space. And this is about context. And the action of in the action of it is G of a map is G invert. Now, now I, I it's a question of how you I'm gonna make it the right axis. So G of G inverse of, of V. Make sure you, <laughs> that's a terrible thing. I knew you would get mad at me. So you do G inverse inside, you apply phi, and then you do G. Both these spaces here are G spaces. So you can do G on X, you can do G on X, and you can do G on Y. Right? That's it, right? It's an inverse on the inside. So, so G, yeah. And you see equivariance. which is this, I just wrote it the other way around. If you don't mind, I'm going to be a, mess, a little bit messy here and, and, and uh, say what this means. So this, uh, this also means G of G inverse of X equals uh, G inverse this. And then I'll bring it over here. G, <laughs> uh, well, okay, I'll leave it here. Uh, is uh, G inverse uh, phi of X. And then I'll bring the G inverse over here. So it's G of V of G inverse of that. Right. <clears throat> well, if you see, if that really is equivariant, that means it, that means that, that equals V of X. Right? So equivariance means invariance. In math. In map. So you have the maps, and in fact, this thing, G acts on the maps, and equivariant maps are the invariant maps. So when I ever put a G up here like that, that means the invariant maps in, in map. And we say phi itself uh, is equivariant with, because it preserves equivariant preserves the action, but really it's just invariant with respect to this action on that. Please learn from me. This is new for many of you, but it makes very good sense to know what space you have and look at the G actions on it and to see what invariance means. And what invariance means here is compatibility with the actions, which is exactly what you want. Right? And we, we underline that by saying the word equivariance. Okay? So you hear these various words in equivariant math. And I just pointed out to you that there's a map. 
let me call it phi, from the homogeneous space G modulo G of X to the orbit uh, G X. These are two sets. This corresponds in the, in the notation here, over here, to X. And this corresponds to the notation over there to Y in this notation here, right? And you just check that this map is equivariant. So in fact, it's, it's bijective. It's, it's, it's exactly an identification of this homogeneous space with an orbit. It's bijective. It's isomorphic in every sense of the word. And, it, and this is a G space by G0 uh, of, of a coset is G0 times the first thing. That's the, that's the G action on this thing. And the G action on an orbit is, is G0 of an orbit point is G0 of the group. I mean, it's, it's the obvious thing. And this is an obvious map. And this thing here is an equivariant isomorphism. In every sense of the word, the homogeneous space is identified with the orbit. That means if you want to look at the orbit abstractly and forget the rest of the stuff, it means you look at the homogeneous space. Okay? And the homogeneous space, you see, is a quotient. And we've already begun to understand quotients with various technology. Uh, and uh, one of the technologies that I will now review again was the averaging technique uh, of Frobenius and um, carried much further by him on Bio and other people. But as soon as you have an orbit, you have a homogeneous space, and you have techniques to handle homogeneous space because it's a quotient, G modulo H. Okay. It would do you, uh, you would do very well to write a little paper about this stuff because it's really fundamental. So I mean, we, we understood it's very nice to, to if you have a home, if you have a quotient to see what what happens. For example, if sometimes if you're very lucky, you can realize the quotient in the space itself by a slice, and that's a perfect fundamental region here. So let me just write that word again: fundamental region. Fundamental regions have deep meaning sometimes. You can understand the quotient much better sometimes if you understand the fundamental region. Okay. So that is another example of a quotient. So another example of a quotient that's important is now let's let that G to be a finite group. We talked about it yesterday, a finite group. And X to be a topological G space. Topological G space. That's a wonderful situation. That means that G, whatever it, what, that means I, that means that G is acting by homeomorphisms. Much, much worse. You don't need so much over there. G is acting linearly. Here, G acting by homeomorphisms. So. When you, you're interested in, in quotients, this is a topological space. The question is, what is the correct topology here? The question is, what is the correct topology? For any G action, I mean, not just finite, it's a heck of a lot better if G is finite, but any G. What's the right topology? The right topology is a quotient topology. Okay. That's 
why it's called in topology the quotient topology. The subject of topology, you should know, there are three, there are three subjects of topology. Just so you know the words. The subject, this subject is point, point, point set topology. This means you talk about open sets and you talk about all these axioms of open sets and closed sets and con continuous maps and all of that stuff. That's called point set topology. In my generation, there was always a basic course of one semester in point set topology. It has vanished from uh, mathematics teaching, but to a certain extent that's a major mistake. It now is embedded a bit in various courses. I'm embedding it here, for example. But it is very useful to have foundation in this subject. You have to train yourself in that. That is one thing. Another thing is called geometric algebraic topology. Kind of, this is the kind of topology that uh, if you're interested in understanding, if you take uh, uh, a nice surface, say this com beautiful compact surface here, you're not interested in understanding the non-trivial curves in this surface, for example. This would be, these would be non-trivial curves in this surface. Um, so this is a, a map from the surface S to algebra. For example, to a group, to a group or a vector space, or um, something like that, to a group. So you have geometry here that you want to understand, and you associate to it an algebraic thing like a group. The algebra at this level. Is not is not abstract algebra. It is this is it's some more or less for me trivial standard algebra. However, the algebra, if you a more modern viewpoint, you you you, you uh, well, let's say categorical algebraic topology. And somebody's calling on Facebook. So categor categorical algebraic topology for people here in physics quite often disappears nowadays in quantum field theory. And what happens is that the physics looks to me to be horribly non-understandable. So if you're not in this subject of uh, the categorical view to uh, algebraic topology, um, you don't see what these guys are doing. Yeah. However, I know very serious people who work in this subject from this point of view. Okay, so it's, my, my observation is it must be interesting because that guy's explaining that to me and I don't understand what he's talking about really. But it, uh, it, it looks very, very abstract, and maybe I can understand it. It's very interesting. These two communities, uh, these two things. It's, uh, life starts, life starts with this thing, and it ends up in this thing. These people don't talk to each other. And where you will find me is from outside, but the technology that I use always is here. Things like cohomology theory and so on. Okay, so I'm more of a classical person. <clears throat> it's so extreme in uh, mathematics. These groups develop and they, do, they go wide, far apart. 
they really don't understand the origins of what this stuff is. I mean, the people working here and doing very deep things, perhaps, but uh, have forgotten completely maybe the geometric side of this thing. I don't believe in that. I believe in Prabhat's point of view that we should keep this historical picture in mind. I don't believe you should define naturality with history. Uh, I mean, if, if you believe that Adolf Hitler was a natural uh, development, it, it may be true, actually, right? I mean, that some dictator, some horrible person, uh, the Vietnam War was a terrible natural thing, but you can claim that's natural. Maybe you could say, I mean, you could say, look, the French were in Vietnam, and then because of this and this, and then you do that, and then you go back, and then some religious guy says, read the Bible, and then you read the New Testament and the Old Testament, and that's, I don't know. Anyway, it's too bad that these people don't talk. This subject is not taught much anymore. And I re recommend you get a little bit of a knowledge of that subject, whatever you need. But what we introduced is an averaging operator. So if, act, if G is, if X is, if it is a topological No, we don't even need a topological thing. So if G is finite, we have the advantage of averaging. Let's think about it a little bit. So let's start. We have a G action, so we X is a G space. Let's assume that G is finite so that we can do something here. And then what we do is we look at the functions on X, say R valued functions. And we look at the G action on, on F. The function. Very interesting idea. You start with you start with a space, you want to understand what the devil is going on. You say, well, the best thing to do is look at the functions on that space. Okay? If this is a topological G space, then you would look at the continuous function. If this is a, a, a complex space or a complex manifold, you might want to look at the holomorphic function. If this is an algebraic variety, you, maybe affine, you want to look at the regular functions. You want to look at the space of functions that's relevant for you in your, in your realm of mathematics. Okay. Now, so you, you ask the question to Prabhak because he's going to tell you what is natural. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but you look at the natural space of functions. I mean, that's completely out. And I think in this case, you and I would agree, usually, what is the natural space of functions, given the context. Right? Right? And in physical applications, I think you also would see what's the natural space of functions. Physics, you have some, you usually have some Hilbert space. Right? So there will be some natural Hilbert space in the background. You'll say, that's the natural space of functions. For those of you who have experience with real analysis, there's always some L2 space hanging around in physics. Right? So it will be, be some Hilbert space. So it's always a natural uh, space of functions. But if you, don't have any, if you don't have any structure here, just, oh, OK, the natural space is just all functions. Right? So how do you define G of a function? How does it act on a function? It takes great courage and psychological dirt, uh, 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 breakthrough to start with the G space and say, let F be a function, I'm going to take G of the function. Yeah. Well, G of the function of X is F, and now I'm going to make you mad as usual. I'm going to put an inverse inside here. And the reason I put an inverse inside there is to make this thing a left action. You understand, if I put a G, if I put no inverse in there, it would be a right action. 
and I, yeah, I want to have a left action here. It's just a formal poem. Okay. So this is the canonical, I think, very natural. If you have G space, you have the action on function. Right? And if G is finite, this is just completely general. This is general. But if G is finite, you have a major, a major, a major advantage. That means you can average. The average of the function with respect to, we were talking yesterday about uh, whether you could generalize this to an integral. I think it's an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind. But, but at least just keep, let's keep this finite for a minute. Yeah? The average of a function is your average. It, you divide it by the number of points in the group, uh, you're at, and, you, and you sum up uh, g to the function. You average, you see, you average over all, all, you push the function around, like we did yesterday. This is another notation for what we did yesterday, but I like it better because I'm just pushing the function around and I average it over that orbit of the function. It's averaging over an orbit. This is an averaging operator, it's wonderful. And this guy, this averaging operator, is a projection from the functions to the invariant function. These oper this averaging operators are pervasive. You must learn that word if you don't know it. Pervasive in mathematics. In particular, in analysis, appeared originally in Fourier analysis. They are everywhere in Fourier analysis. Yes? And I will tell you that if you talk, and applied mathematicians and so on are talking about these things, they understand perfectly in some incredibly complicated way because they're geniuses. They're, yes, all this. Are, but quite often they're just talking about an averaging operation. Yeah. Okay. And so it's very nice. You use the following, you use the averaging operator, A, in the case, of course, where G is finite, G is finite, I'm, I'm emphasizing this finiteness here, and, and, and X is a, top, a topological G space. This was the last part of my lecture yesterday. I'm still reviewing, but it doesn't hurt to review. All right? And so what you do is a, it's a, a wonderful projection of the continuous functions, not just the functions. It takes a continuous function and it averages, you get a continuous function. Check it. That's why writing a little paper on, on quotients is, in, is not a bad idea. It takes the continuous functions and maps and maps to the, uh, uh, to the invariant functions, and it's a projection. You should think here is the function space of all functions, continuous functions. Maybe you're lucky. Those of you who were lucky enough to have my analysis one lecture, you know there's a topology on the space of continuous functions if you have a compact interval or something. It's called the soup norm topology. So, on, uh, and quite often you're, you're very lucky you can even define the inner product on it. That means you can define orthogonality on it. You define all these things on it. And in fact, this will be usually an orthogonal projection. You take a function and average it and you get you get, a, you get a, 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 a continuous function. It's a projection from the functions to the continuous functions to, to the uh, invariant functions. And the, the invariant functions are just the functions on the quotient space. You have to check it. In the quotient topology, there are that, the functions on the quotient space. This is magnificent that you have a method of taking functions upstairs and getting functions downstairs. 
And the method is called average. Right. Yeah. This, this is, of course, an isomorphism. And the isomorphism, quite frankly, written down is called pi star, but you can, I mean, pull back a function. So you can really make this all beautifully precise, a very precise situation using the average unit operator. And yesterday, the last remark in the, in the lecture yesterday was X, Hausdorff, <coughs> using the average R X T4, R X something. Uh, implies x modulo g. How's dark t4 and so on. Etc. What happened? By averaging. It's wonderful. Yeah. I want to uh, write some names on the blackboard because these are names. I really, I, I don't know these people because they're uh, older than I am. They died before I'm born. In fact, the one man I mentioned was, was died almost exactly on my birthday. So that gives you a, an idea of the generational thing. But I know their work and I love it, love it very much. There is a great Berlin mathematician named Fobenius. And he had a student uh, named Shu, student of Fabinius. So Fabinius was a, uh, also a, in the 19th, but well, 19th into the 20th century. And Shu, uh, well, he died, I'll tell you when I was born. In, uh, I emphasize this in Israel, which must have been highly non-trivial in those years, in 1941. Yeah, so I, I can't remember when he was born, but he was he was died rather an old old person, and um, was born sometime in the uh, 19th uh, century. So yeah, it's very interesting. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> sure, uh, fortunately, realized that it was a very bad place to be in the 1930s and so on in, Israel, in uh, Germany, and he moved to Israel. But you can imagine what Israel was in, say, the 1930s. It's just amazing. I mean, you, you accept, for example, the Saudi Arabia, if you go to, I don't know, someplace in Saudi Arabia, you got these tall skyscrapers and you have these guys walking around in white robes and they all are worth billions of dollars, and, and then they kill journalists and so on, and it's just incredible. And, and then you have these other guys. That was nothing but a desert. Those countries basically did not exist in those years. You have to look at the history. It's very, very remarkable. Right? And this guy, Schuer, who was pushed out of Germany because of his faith, uh, fortunately survived and, and did good work in Israel, uh, went to Israel in the early times. I, I don't remember when he went. You can certainly look at the Wiki page and check it when he went, but it was early. Before there was any, he, he was never really in danger here in, in terms of going to some prison camp or something. He got out of here, he was smart enough to get out. Um, and he, the, the, the incredible person was this, and I would say also sure, these ideas of averaging and so on, what is going on here, are entirely due to this guy. You have to understand this guy, the definition of the word group was defined by Jordan someplace in the middle 19th century, and this guy proved all basic theorems before the 20th century. Isn't that incredible? It's really incredible. So this is one of the most wonderful mathematicians ever to live, and I think sure also, but uh, I don't know as much about it. And then, of course, uh, Hermann Weyl looked at this stuff, and, and he knew Weyl wasn't stupid. I mean, he, he really knew that uh, you should be looking at this, and uh, he transformed that into other groups, which I will talk about in a minute. <clears throat> Wonderful 
So averaging operators uh, do good things. And because uh, you asked a little bit about how do you average if the group is not finite, with something like that, I wanted to motivate my next lectures by giving an example of that. Okay. So another example. <clears throat> is where x is equal to g. So this is good. And this group is the first group you see that's, that's uh, really interesting, uh, but in some sense small, S1. And S1 is the elements, let me write it in the complex numbers, the elements of the complex numbers whose absolute value I always like square equals one. If you haven't seen this notation before, the word the letter S stands for sphere. This and the word number one stands for the radius of the sphere. Yes. Oh, the dimension of the sphere. It's good to have audience people <laughs> you don't understand what I said because you were stupid. And so I can correct myself. The one is the, is the dimension of the sphere. So this is the dimension. So in general, more general, you would have Sn. This is the n-dimensional sphere. Maybe I'll just write it down. x1 squared plus x uh, n squared equal 1 in Rn. Oh, no, in Rn, uh, uh, I have to put an n plus 1 here. No, in Rn. S, S, oh, no, I want it to be, no, what did I say? This, this, is, the, yeah, this is the dimension, this is the dimension, so I better put this in Rn plus 1. Right, because the, the, the two sphere is in R3. And so, right, the two dimensional, the earth is in space. So in our, in our n plus 1. But we have the convenient thing here that we have the complex norm here, which we've been talking about at lunch, whether that's what that means. That's a very interesting norm, complex norm. That's, remind yourself that the complex norm is z times z bar. It's a very important fact. And of course, you should always draw a picture. This is just the, the circle maybe in, around the origin. This is S1. Now, you should think, please think, S1. Well, it's acting linearly uh, on, it's acting linearly on, well, on a lot of things, but uh, let's say on, first of all, on the complex numbers. Well, let's, let's even call the vector space the complex number. It's a one-dimensional complex vector space. So it acts linearly on the complex vector sp complex numbers. Namely, you take an element, uh, lambda, oh, it's the stupid action. Lambda times of B, it's the stupid action, lambda times B. Right. But, uh, it's okay. And, so here's lambda in here, and you take lambda here and you multiply it by lambda. Yeah. So the way to think about this guy is this. Is that S1 is contained in GL1. <laughs> See? S1's acting, this is a one by one matrix, right? It's just acting linearly, this is a linear action. This is the simplest possible thing you can think of. Multiplying by a complex number, and for, to dedicate it to you, I made it in the circle. I like the circle better, 
because it's small. It's not like some. It's not like our problem in Hausdorff. Remember, we had this problem with the, the R plus action and the quotient of the R action. It's not Hausdorff, but the, the circle is a very good topological space. So the circle is a very good topological space, and this is going to be our group. And this is also going to be the space where it's acting. But let the circle act on itself. It doesn't matter left or right because it's a commutative group. So this is a circle acting on a circle. The one nice thing about the circle is, is if you go to bed at night and say, what is the nice property? Why is the circle good? Why is that S, S1 good? I just hate that expression, but I, it's terrible because my grandchildren use it. I say, how you doing? I'm good! That's, that somehow is a perversion of the English language. But everybody uses it, right? I'm good, I'm good. You okay? I, yeah, I'm good. Okay, it's cool. So, so you know, why is the circle good? Now, first of all, the circle's infinite. So that whole technology of, of averaging uh, is going to be a problem, right? Maybe. And so it's good. It's, it's infinite. But it is compact. Now, uh, I see some, still see some young faces here. Not everybody's quit. Uh, <laughs> younger faces. What does compact mean? Compact is a word that you have a feeling for. So it means it's not so big. In this context, compact means you can't run off to infinity. It means you can't run off, run away to infinity. Which means that if you have a sequence of points, Pn, let's say a k is the, a k for compact. The word compact in English and the word compact in German is the same word, compact. And therefore, the history of much mathematics is German, and so the usual letter for compact in mathematics is k. Compact, same word. So if k is a compact set, and this is a sequence in k, uh, then there exists a convergent subsequence. ZNK, uh, PNK. Every sequence has a convergent subsequence. Um, you've heard of this. This is called the bolzano weierstrass property. Maybe Kevin talked about that a little bit. Yeah. He mentioned that. Every sequence has a convergent subsequence. You know, of course, a, a compact interval has that property, right? I mean, a closed interval. But if the interval is open, it doesn't have that property because you can run off to the end. Right? You see what I mean? If something is really open, then you can run off to, to the boundary, and the boundary is not there. But if the boundary is there, <laughs> you're okay. Yeah. Okay, so you've got the feeling for compact. And, and of course, it's completely intuitively clear that the circle is compact. Um, I mean, you can't run. It's, it's completely good. Okay? So we say, because everything here is wonderful, that the circle G, G, S, S, which is S1, is a compact topological group. Just the induced topology from being an R. And more so, 
the group operations are all continuous. So it, it's, it's a compact, it's a, it's a topological group, it means it has a topology, it means the group actions are continuous, the multiplication is continuous, the inverse is continuous, everything is continuous, everything you look at is continuous, and it's a compact, it's a compact uh, topological space. And now, this is what we were talking about a little bit yesterday. Suppose you have an action of the compact topological group S1. What this subject is called is Fourier analysis. This is the origin of Fourier analysis. In quantum mechanics, they talk continuously, speaking of continuous, about waves, right? Or wave functions. This is, in reality, elementary Fourier theory. Right? Elementary Fourier. You're dealing with, with, with what are called Fourier polynomials. So let's talk about that a little bit. So let's let's look at the The possibility. Uh, uh, so let's look at the G. Let's look at the G action on on B. So I, I, it's been a while. I've I made a little bit of a diversion. V is just the, the vector space where we are. Okay. V is a complex not complex. But v action. Of and we know that the best thing to look at are functions. So look at the G action on functions. Well, the space of functions is horrible. So let's take at least uh, good functions. So let me ch change the space action on, what do I call this? Uh, on, I don't know, good function. I'm good, okay, on good function. Never write that in, in, a, in a scientific article. Never write the word good. This is a non-scientific word in English language. I know authors who write that and I don't like that. Right. In the context of this lecture, I, I know about authors who write, we consider quotients and with, with properties that are uh, appropriate in a given context, and they say that's a good quotient. You see it written throughout the literature. I don't like that. Okay. So it's, it, I'm a little bit crazy about that. So action on good functions. This is, this is uh, for, for you. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Go back to the square. We have the circle sitting in the vector space. It's a wonderful situation. We have the action on functions on the vector space. So, action on good functions on the vector space. I've been on top of all you people uh, a lot. It's been perhaps unfair. What is the simplest good function you can think of on the complex? The vector space is a copy of the complex numbers. Just, right. Can you think of a good function? I mean, the simplest one? Anybody got a function? Mr. Weiss is never afraid. What? Tell you identity. The identity. <laughs> Very good. The identity, Mr. Weiss calls it the identity, but you see Prabhat also goes back historically, he takes the standard co coordinates, uh, standard basis of vector space, right? And the identity is then called Z, right? right. In, in Prabhat's coordinates, right? right. So this function, this, this function is Mr. Weiss's identity, right? F of, right? Z. And, and this is the identity on, 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 uh, as a function, 
So this is the, the I, I view this as, a, as a sort of the standard linear function. on V. And what I do, I restrict it to the circle. But I don't say much about it because I'm, I'm interested in functions on the circle. But I don't say that. I just restrict it and that's it. Okay. Now, if that's the standard linear function, what's the next function you would look at? Yeah. Translation? That does not, that, does, that somehow destroys the circle. I agree with you. That's true. But it, it right? Yeah, somehow or another, I don't like it moving the circle. Yeah. I, that's the standard linear function. Did you what you like? Well, ro rotation? Rotation? I can't hear you. Rotation? Rotation. Yes. Yeah, but uh, so rotation, what do you mean? Oh, rotation, but e to the i theta. Yes. But that's the same function. Um, or you can take, well, differentiable or holomorphic function. Well, yeah, very good, but yes. Yeah. Z bar? Hmm? Z bar? That's very interesting. I like, I like what she just said. You might take Z bar, right? Because the complex conjugation, it reverses the orientation of the circle. But this, let's keep in mind uh, uh, Maria's idea. We had the linear function Z. And the uh, it's still linear over the reals, but uh, z and z bar uh, are generated in some sense really important functions. Any other candidates for good function? If you're doing, come on, we're going to do a seminar. Uh, these people have been begging me to give a seminar next. Yeah, if you're doing algebra, what's I mean. You don't want to stick around with linear stuff, do you? Right? Hmm? Polynomials. Polynomials. Isn't that true? That's really, I mean, you just have to think. Polynomials is true. Right? So, uh, and I, I want to leave it uh, later on to what Maria is suggesting here, but certainly you would look at z, z squared, and so on. Yeah? And then linear combinations of z and z squared and so on give you all the possible polynomials. So let's uh, look at that. There's a great, uh, is anybody here Chinese? I don't think. There was a great Chinese mathematician in modern times, in places like Taiwan and Hong Kong, there have been great mathematicians, mostly USI or oriented, but now since the opening of China, there have been a number of interesting modern Chinese mathematicians at great universities in Beijing, Shanghai, uh, one very nice university is Fudan University in Shanghai. But most of the uh, Chinese mathematicians who are very, very famous are from Hong Kong or particularly from Hong Kong or even Macau. Uh, and they're now at American universities. But this great Chinese mathematician wrote a book, which is a significant book. He was trained in Moscow, so came back to China and so on. He, his name is Hua. Uh, I'm sure I don't, say, I don't say it very well. Uh, he wrote a book that's more or less, uh, uh, 
called just starting with the circle. He's a very deep thinking uh, mathematician, and I started in this lecture with a square, <laughs> and Hua started with a circle, and so we're going to what Hua thinks is important, and of course he's right, that you have a circle embedded in the plane, acting on the, on the plane, which is a complex vector space of dimension one, and here it is, S1, and so we have the X1 action on the functions, and, and not on just any old function, uh, on the polynomials, and just so you know a notation, if you write that, the C of V, these are the complex polynomials on a vector space V. These are the complex polynomials, complex in the sense of the complex coefficients, polynomials. Uh, on on the vector space V. And this action is very natural. We just talked to uh, various members of the audience. You have the identity that's the simplest one. It somehow generates this thing. Z in the sense of an algebra. Z, Z squared, Z cubed. It's somehow a generator of that. But also, uh, maybe, let's, let's we, I like very much uh, Maria's remark here, maybe I want to look at Z bar also. Let's keep that in the back of our minds right now, Z bar. I'm not rejecting what you're saying, Maria, I like it actually. But if you write the restriction of Z, restricted to the circle, then you write it as e to the 2 pi i, I don't know how you write it, but some people write it as z to the 2 pi i theta, right? The identity restricted to the circle. I don't know, since I'm trying to answer your question, is that, do you usually write that? What, what, do, you, what do you write? Uh, well, no, I don't know what you write in high school. What do you, what, I don't know, cosine theta plus I sine theta. I mean, that's, a, yeah, that's, is that, that's what you write? Maybe, yeah. Okay, let's do it. But I don't like it very well because I, I what is this, what is this equal to? This is equal to what? E to the I theta. I theta? Ah, it's equal to e to the i theta, and then the period is 2 pi. Yeah. Right? My period is 2 pi i or something. So that's probably what you write, it's e to the i theta, right? Okay, so if that is z, so if z, yeah, I, that, that's, that's z, e to the i theta, which is cosine theta e to the i theta. So if you have an angle theta here, uh, this is the point e to the i theta. Right? And, of course, what you're doing here is you're identifying the circle and you, know, you do it in some non-trivial way in high school that you never understand. And there are words here that I never understood, radiance. The word is radian. So you identify it with the interval 0 to 2 pi. And you don't count that as, because it, you identify that with 2 pi. So you don't count that endpoint. So right, that's the circle somehow, right? So somehow here's theta running around in here. Getting close to our discussion yesterday, where I have a compact thing, uh, but I go to an interval and somehow I use periodicity. Okay. Okay. And now the idea of Maria, although I'm not sure she meant it this way, but it was a very good idea, is z to the z bar is e to the minus i theta, and this is cosine theta. Uh, let's see, cosine. What's even and what's odd here? Uh, cosine is uh, starts with uh, starts with one, therefore it goes one and x squared and x fourth and so on. So it's minus i theta. Well, of course it's bar. 
<laughs> so this operation on trigonometric functions, right? Or maybe trigonometric polynomials, you've heard that word, right? A trigonometric polynomial is a polynomial in Z and Z bar because you 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 want this. So maybe what what we should be looking at here, I'm not never sure, is the polynomials and the way of writing that is this. The polynomial ring generated by z and z bar. Maybe. I think that's what we look at effectively. Right? Yeah. And so an element here, you have the g action on this. On the polynomial ring z and z bar. And it's a wonderful action because it comes from the action of G on the circle. Okay. okay. Let's just say a few things about this action. This action is linear. And we write this, this is a linear representation. in this case, which is the circle. So let me write it down again. It's the, it's the action of G on, on the polynomials. And I think Maria had a good idea, so I put in the bar part. It acts on polynomials. It is an action on functions, but I mean it stabilizes the, the trigonometric polynomials. And the action is given by a trigonometric polynomial. If you take lambda and g, and you take a trigonometric polynomial, uh, a trigonometric polynomial, then then it gets mapped to the polynomial. Uh, uh, well, that the uh, inverse. Or lambda. It doesn't matter much here because the group is a billion, but that makes it a left action. That is the action on trigonometric polynomials. This is Fourier analysis. This is what is called Fourier analysis. Okay. And now, uh, this is interesting. Uh, so, we want to discuss the how to uh, understand. Okay, this is an example of an axis, and this is a linear representation of G on trigonometric polynomials. So, more generally, this was an example. More generally, uh, you could have an action of G on any topological space, uh, action of G on X topological, and you go to the induced associated action functions, C of X. Here is an example of functions which are not, which are much, much best, better than continuums. Right? Polynomials in Z and Z bar. They're called trigonometric polynomials. Right? More generally, you, come, you go to an associated action on continuous functions. And I will from now on talk about complex value continuums. This is a linear representation. What does that mean? It means 
It means, first of all, to have such a thing, this thing, the continuous functions, are vector space. That's completely obvious. If you have two continuous functions in this thing, complex value continuous function, or anything value continuous function, and you have two numbers, you can take a linear combination. It's obvious. This is a vector space. This action is linear. The action is linear. So G of a linear combination, just check what it is, F, uh, oh, 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 that is a terrible thing. This is terrible, to F and G, I, I apologize. We have, to, we have to do something, let's do something better about it, F1 and F2. All right. Now G of A, F1, uh, B, F2 is equal to A of G, F1 plus B, uh, G of F2. Right. I mean, it's completely obvious. Right. It's completely obvious. It's completely obvious. And now, that's what a linear representation is. This is a vector space. This is a linear representation of G on this vector space. And now, this mapping, A, and now I'm dedicating this to you. <laughs> a is a mapping from the continuous functions to the invariant continuous functions. We use it all over the place, this averaging operator. And we use it for a finite group where we could define it. And here we have, this is an amazing thing. We have the Fourier polynomials where G, where G acts by rotation. We have the continuous functions where G acts, X is, uh, X, the continuous functions uh, on the group. On, on the group, uh, on, let's say x is s1, so s1, Fourier polynomials on the group. Well, let's let x be s the group. Yeah. And then we ask uh, people who had my uh, linear uh, my analysis one lecture, what is the right topology on this continuous function? As everybody here says. A soup going topology. Right? Soup going topology is the right topology. The distance between two functions is the soup norm of the difference. Right? That's good. And physicists will tell you that is not the right topology. Physicists will tell you they want a Hilbert space. So I see Tristan there is a, you're studying physics. Yes. You want a Hilbert space. You will hear this. This means you have an inner product. This means you have a way of measuring out your angles and, and length and so on. And you put this, and you look for the right Hilbert space here. And this right Hilbert space has a name. It's called L2 of X. Well, some of you have had some experience with functional analysis, the beginning of functional analysis. Yes? This Fourier theory. So this is something to keep in mind. You have the circle. You have the correct functions, simple-minded functions, the Fourier polynomials, the group acts. You have the continuous function, the group acts. You have the, the, the associated Hilbert space, the group acts. Right? If you don't write this down carefully, if you're interested in the subject, you're stupid. You should write it down carefully. Yeah? What are the actions? What does this all mean? It's a fundamental situation. So this averaging, and I'm getting back to answering your question. How on the devil can you average because the group itself is uh, infinite, right? So how do you average something? Average a function, some interesting function. So you average a function about, so remember what the averaging operator was. You average a function and you sum over the group 
uh, g is a function, and you, you, you norm it by 1 over the, the uh, area of the group. That was for finite groups. And now we want to generalize this to the circle. Okay. okay. Now, you've done this in high school, but you didn't realize what you were doing. Okay. You integrate over the circle. I'm sure you've seen something like, haven't you seen, I have a little place for it here, the integral, you change variables, and the variable is the circle maybe, and you change, you change this, you have this function, and you write it, you write it here from zero to two pi, and, and this function is, uh, for example, sine is zero, and then at pi over two it's one, and then at, at minus pi, at, at pi it's, it's and this function is sine. And so you certainly know that the integral from, from 0 to 2 pi of sine theta, d theta, is 0. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, you did this all the time in high school or in, in Mickey Mouse mathematics, right? Isn't it true? Right? And then you, then, then you have all sorts of complicated things. For example, I know. Uh, because I was once in high school also. So for, let's do that because uh, you're getting tired and it, we, we should have some fun. Let's, let's do that. The interval, let, let's, let's see here. Uh, let's try to set up a stupid problem that you might have had to solve in, 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 in Mickey Mouse mathematics. Uh, Let's see here. So when, you, when you do the substitution, right? You have to do a substitution. Right. Uh, I don't know. You do a substitution. If you, don't you do it? Let, let, let's just see. You do some stupid integral like this. Integral 1 over, this is a terrible thing, look at it. 1 over the square root of 1, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll do 1 minus x squared. Be a, right? This is an example of a stupid integral. Somebody made you do, they, they took you and beat something over your head and made you do this integral, right? It's ridiculous. And then so, so then you worry about what the interval is. But I mean, you, so you take x equals uh, cosine, I don't know what we do, sine or cosine, doesn't matter probably. Sine, sine theta, and you say, well, you put this in here, and uh, this is a uh, square root of uh, one minus sine squared is, is if you're lucky out, it's probably cosine theta, and uh, uh, the this is incredible. Look at this, and then d of this thing is is is, is the d of, of, of dx is equal to. Uh, you differentiate sine is minus the cosine maybe or plus the cosine plus. It's plus the see you know you know how to do this Mickey Mouse mathematics. And, and then you always put a d theta here, right? You don't know what the hell d theta is, but you put it there. And and so this is uh, cosine of theta uh, d theta. And this thing is uh, one d theta. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> and then, then you get scared because you, you, you have to put these, I don't know, A to B, and then you have to worry about this, these, these things here, and then it's painful. But you end up with an integral over the circle. Isn't it true? Over at least a piece of the circle. Maybe, maybe you, you, you only go from 0 to pi over 2 or something like this. I don't know. Who knows? Right? But you, uh, you, go, you end up with an integral over the circle. Is it not right? You have been integrating over the circle all your lives. Right? And you didn't, you didn't really uh, emphasize that fact yet. So then, then you want to average something over the circle. You want to average something. You see, we average something over the group. Right? It is precisely the same thing. I will now... I will now write the averaging operator 
the averaging operator of a function. F is a function, say, on the circle, on x, where x is, uh, x is uh, equal. I don't know, it's something, is, 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 a, is a, a g space. And, and g is the circle. You saw this averaging operator of Frobenius, Schur, Hermann Weil, and so on. It's incredibly important, you agree. I, I have to define what this thing is. Well, it should be the same. It's the integral over the circle. Well, I, I'm not going to write 2 pi and all that crap. I mean, it's just over S1, right? It's the average of, of, of g. g is in the circle. g of the function. That means composed with g, dg. Now, g happens to be in the circle, so you write g theta all your life. d theta all your life. But you're integrating over the circle, so you should write dg. You're right, integrating over the group, so you should write d of the element in the group. <coughs> Same proof. Yeah, you, you, you make sure that volume is 1, so that's what we did by scaling. D, the integral of gg over the circle should be... Uh, well, let me put here group G should be one. Right? You to, if you're going to average, should be one. So you take uh, average thing. That's the thing. So you see when you have the possibility of, integra of integrating instead of summing, you're in business. And the key thing is this group is compact. So if you have a continuous function on something compact like that, it can't blow up. And so, right, it can't blow up. So it means that the integrals are all finite. You don't need to worry. Okay? It's one. So what we learn is averaging can be extended. to compact groups, topological groups. Groups, if you have DG, so if DG makes sense. topological groups some people call DG what is called a har measure and it exists for most topological compact so compact. Well, for most compact groups of interest, of interest, it is a very simple matter to write down DG. It's very easy. Yeah. 
dedicated to you because you wanted to see how it works for bigger groups. It doesn't work for non-compact groups. It doesn't work so well anyway. But for compact groups, you can just close your eyes and think that they're finite. And the reason you can close your eyes is that a sum is more or less an integral. All right. You just have to think. We talked yesterday about this, right? I mean, an infinite sum of a Riemann integral is just an appropriate infinite sum by approximation. Right? In the limit. Yeah. And, and if you don't have any possibility of blowing up, and you take the limit, well, it's OK. And the, the, what happened, the, the obstruction to blowing up, keeping you from blowing up, is compactness. If you have compactness, you can't blow up. That's what I say. You can't run off to infinity. I think we should quit now. Thank you very much. So we'll see you this afternoon.